And uh, today we're going to uh, talk about our book, the uh, coming book in uh, June 24th, The Declaration of Independence. and that, uh, you know, this is a political manifesto of a different sort. I suspect it'll be the only uh, political book this year which name-checks the shock rock band Wars album, This Toilet Earth. Uh, and I uh, also doubt many other uh, books will have lines and it's along the lines of uh, if the only choices we have are between uh, Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner, the uh, survivors will envy the dead. Uh, but, uh, and uh, actually, speaking of choices, uh, Reason uh, Foundation, Reason Magazine, Reason uh, uh, dot, uh, com, dot TV, the think tank world about choice. I just, a uh, reader uh, and a fellow, uh, a guy, Scott Ewine, who was on the uh, cruise and is a world traveler, sent this uh, photo, which I thought everybody would uh, get a kick out of. I got it yesterday from him. He was in Russia, and this is uh, in Moscow, and this is a famous statue of Marx, and you'll note at the bottom, he put his reason took that there. <laughs> kind of a uh, fantastic world, and as we uh, seem to be hell bent on following the uh, Soviet Union into the dustbin of history as a free market economy, it's worth thinking. I, I think, you know, uh, uh, as many of you know, uh, Lanny Friedlander, the uh, gentleman who actually uh, started Reason Magazine as a student at Boston University in 1968, died a few weeks ago, uh, and um, it's amazing, certainly in Lanny's uh, dream, I, I'm sure when he started the uh, magazine and, and he had no idea that it would turn into this foundation and an intergalactically recognized think tank and what have you, <laughs> thanks to people like you, um, but also that he would live in a world where the Soviet Union no longer existed and in many ways we've achieved a lot of freedom, which is actually a lot of what the book is about. Um, so the starting points of the Declaration of Independence for us we're really that, um, you know, Matt and I, uh, and mostly me, Matt is really a Tommy Simp Pinko, uh, as he said, I'll be explaining that in a little bit. But, uh, you know, we believe that life is best where politics is least and where decentralization and democratization of power and decision making is greatest and most dispersed. And that, you know, this is basically classical liberalism. Uh, the idea that concentrations of power are a bad thing and that also individuals have some kind of inherent dignity. I have, by the way, used up all of my inherent dignity and I, I, I am uh, taking on as much debt to uh, bring dignity back as possible to me. But uh, that, uh, you know, we have the right to, to live our lives the way we want to as long as we're not, you know, massively infringing on other people's rights or even minimally in, infringing on other people's rights. So that's a big starting point. And then, you know, the, the kind of uh, uh, dinner party uh, uh, conversation question, which is just why do we have more choices at a Starbucks or, you know, at a coffee shop than we do at the ballot box? And the, not necessarily talking about, you know, we, we can either vote Republican or Democratic, um, but, uh, you know, why do the two parties look so much alike? I mean, there's obvious structural reasons why we have two parties that are dominant uh, in, the, in U.S. history. I mean, those parties have changed over time, uh, and what Democrats and Republicans stand for or stand against has changed over time, but it's always two parties. It's always going to be two parties because we have a first-past-the-post system, but why don't we have more Ron Pauls in the Republican Party? Why don't we have uh, you know, more Joe Manchins, the uh, interesting West Virginia uh, senator uh, in the Democratic Party had been the governor of West Virginia and got an A from the Cato Institute in their governor, uh, governor report uh, last year. Uh, you know, why, do, why does every, you know, uh, I guess I'm a bad person to say this, but uh, when you think about political parties and the politicians, it's like what Henry Ford said about customers picking their own color of a car. They can have whatever color they want as long as it's black. In the Republicans and Democrats, it's just endless replication of the same boring, uh, useless people for the most part. 
Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, what uh, really got us going on the book project uh, was that we recognized that people have been fleeing identification with uh, Democrats and Republicans for years. Th this is a, a talk series from the, the Gallup poll that starts back in 1988 and goes forward to uh, 2010. And one of the things that you can see is that uh, Republicans and Democrats now are less popular than people who, this is what they ask, uh, how do you, regardless of how you vote, regardless of your registration, how do you, what do you consider yourself, how do you identify yourself? And uh, what has happened over time is that the number of people who say I'm an independent has risen and the people who say I'm a Democrat or a Republican has faded and uh, there is no question across a wide variety of measures that party identification of people saying, you know what, I've got maybe three or four things that I say I am. I am a man, I am uh, from New Jersey, I am an American, I'm from New Jersey, I'm a father, or whatever. It, the, the likelihood that people are strongly going to say I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat is fading because people don't like those brands anymore. Uh, and with that, uh, you know, and so what we're seeing when we talk about the Declaration of Independence, independent voters are absolutely where the action is. Everybody recognizes it. Certainly the, the major parties do because that's who they're going after. They've got their base and they've each got about a third of the population. So it's the people in the middle. We're going to talk about wh who are the independents and why they might be libertarian and why we might reach them. And uh, now? Some political watchers are saying this could be the nastiest, most negative election season of all time. This campaign season seems like candidates have taken dirty to a whole new level. When pundits start shouting and politicians start calling each other's names, it can seem like a return to civility is not possible. Like they, the very idea is a relic of some bygone, bygone era. John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson, and I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with crimes. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames, female chastity violated, children writhing on a pike? I'm John Adams, and I approve this message because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes, and Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. The nastiest, most negative elections... Candidates have taken dirty to a whole new... It can level. seem like a return to civility is not possible. We're trying to bring back the hoe cake, uh, Nick and I. We'll be, uh, I just don't see how it can be an insult. <laughs> um, so the question is, independents are, every single new polling period, independents are reaching something close to a brand new high. Since 1970, independents have gone from roughly 17, 18% to now it's 38, approaching 40%. Every new polling period, most recently I, that I saw from, I think, Gallup in January, Democrats are at an all-time low. Um, the, the trend lines are unmistakable. So who are these independents? What do we know about them? Um, there is a school of thought, and unsurprisingly, it is a school of thought that is tethered or championed by people who tend to be more partisan uh, than perhaps the people in this room, uh, that independents are just morons uh, for the most part. They're people who can't come up with their own preferences. They don't follow politics enough, and, that, and we all know that's a terrible thing uh, to do, uh, and that they are basically, uh, uh, they are partisans, but they don't really know it. Uh, Jonah Goldberg uh, uh, wrote a, a memorable column about that in the, in the LA Times uh, a year or so ago. On the left, you hear people say that we are in the midst of, and this is something that Emily can talk to you about in more detail, because she's an actual professional about this stuff. But we're, we're in a, a polarization moment where 
Democrats and Republicans are actually becoming more polarized, and so are independents themselves. They are more polarized than they have been for a long time, that they roughly mirror uh, the uh, two major parties. These are sort of self-serving uh, narratives because the two major political parties don't want there to be anything else. They don't want any disruption in their world, unpredictability in their world. The fact is, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later, uh, they, independents specifically, are creating a new unpredictability in the political process, and the two major parties are panicking. The short answer to who, or the beginning of an answer to who these people are, is simply who they vote for. And we find out that they're basically the swing vote uh, at this moment. You can see independents brought back uh, Democrats, specifically in 2006, uh, and they rode Obama and the Democrats to, party in, uh, to power in 2008. Look at that bottom number for independents and Obama. The, that number came out, I think, this morning. Um, independents are now 35% uh, favorability ra rating for Barack Obama after being 56% just a year and change ago. Uh, that's a real bad number for him. He's got, uh, he's got some issues. Um, independence in Congress, as you can see, there are swinging violently back and forth. That 42 to 33 number is a different source than the other one, so I don't know how uh, strong it is. But you can see with the recent unpleasantness in Washington that it could be that they're swinging now against the perceived uh, meanness of Republicans. Slide, please. I've wanted to do this for a really long time. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, this is just sort of a, an, an interesting bobble out there, the Tea Party uh, movement, which I think in, in many respects is just the most interesting thing that's happened to American politics in the last two decades uh, in many ways, um, to see where independents fit in with them. And basically, they don't know about the Tea Party too much. Uh, and, and as they're starting to know more they are starting to, uh, to like them a little bit less, a higher unf unfavorability rating, although the favorability remains pretty constant. I am shocked that there is any poll of anybody, whether they're independent or not, that is favorable of the Tea Party, considering just the horrendous press that the Tea Party has gotten from the beginning <coughs> as a retrograde, racist, you know, <laughs> barely ape-like movement of angry white people. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's astonishing on a daily basis, and it's something that we have been writing about in, in attending these rallies and doing a lot of recent TV videos. The gap between the, the normal portrayal of the uh, Tea Party and the kind of things that we talk to when we actually you know, interview a Tea Party person. There's a, uh, Rand Paul had a great speech on the Senate floor, I think just yesterday or the day before, uh, challenging his colleagues to actually meet a Tea Party person and talk to them before ever describing them again. Um, <laughs> slide please now. So, question is how, uh, how libertarian are they? Uh, where's the libertarian vote? Where's the overlap here? It's been a series of interesting studies by David Bowes and David Kirby. Um, uh, affiliated with the Cato Institute, and we are thankfully starting a, a series of much more interesting studies uh, now here. Uh, no, the polling project for us is going to be it's going to be phenomenal because we're going to be getting at people's actual preferences and not trying to skew the results to sell one party or or another, and try to figure out what the sense of trade-offs are and and uh, uh, where people think. Um, Interesting headline. To me, the most interesting thing about uh, the David Bose thing, well, first of all, the, the basic number that they've come up with, there's a 14% of the vote uh, in the country that can be reliably described as libertarian according to their uh, sort of definitions. And that's up from around 9% in 1990. They have a broader number of, of people in America carving through polls who describe themselves as fiscally conservative, socially tolerant. And that number can go as high as 59 percent. Uh, and, and any uh, polling that you look at, those numbers are on the rise, particularly since 2008 and, uh, and TARP and all the uh, unpleasantness that has uh, come since then. Libertarians themselves, when they self-identify, if you take that 14 uh, percent, more than half of them don't call themselves libertarian. Um, and many of them have never even heard the word. So people who have the tendency don't know the label. The label is more of a self-conscious thing that people have been talking about in think tanks and in sort of self-conscious political movements over the last four decades. Um, as you can see, a quarter of libertarians uh, call themselves independent in general. Um, and especially the Ron Paul libertarians, campus libertarians, Alex McCobin can tell you about, um, those people 
are actually independents and not necessarily subsets of the Republican Party. Uh, Ron Paul supporters did not like John McCain, whereas if you look at the broader libertarian vote, it still went 53 percent uh, for John McCain. Would highlight just those numbers there. This is the kind of the great Cold War split, right? Before 19, uh, bef before the end of uh, fall of communism, the libertarian vote was more or less a subset of, uh, of the Republican Party, and afterwards, it's much more up for grabs. And if you break it down by congressional uh, uh, elections every two years, those uh, uh, trends are just on the increase. Um, slide. Yes, sir. Um, I can't tell you the exact 7288 ones, but for uh, the presidential elections in 2000, 2004, and 2008, it goes basically, um, I believe it was 46% Bush, this is 2000, 32% uh, 20, third party, uh, and 10% Gore in, in 2000. 2004, and I might have a number here uh, or two wrong, um, it was something like 34% Bush, no, 40-something uh, percent Bush, 26% uh, third party, and 15% uh, Kerry. And then in uh, 2008, 53% McCain, again, 26% third party, and 15% Obama. So it's moving around, um, basically. It, and the, uh, and the, the congressional by-elections is even more violent. It was basically 70-20. Uh, in 2000 and 2002, Republicans versus Democrats with a you know six percent other, uh, and then in 2006 and eight, it was essentially 50-50 or close to it, uh, and that is now and that changed violently again in 2010, which which tracks independence. Independence, as we saw previously, were super Democrat in 2006 and 08 in the congressional elections, and then flipped and went super Republican in 2010. Um, as we talked about before with, with uh, Nick. So why is this? Why, why are we seeing this increase? Why are they behaving this way? I um, would argue that uh, largely it's because the, the two main brands, I mean, we think about duopolies and old and tired duopolies out there in the culture. These aren't just tired duopolies or, or geriatric uh, duopolies. They've been around since basically the 19th century. And what do classic duopolies do everywhere in the market? They basically uh, take their captive audience and they treat them like captives. Uh, this is true even in the private sector where you don't have a guaranteed revenue stream, which you do in politics. Um, if you, and even when you look there at a place like, uh, what are the two main uh, uh, beer companies? It's Miller Coors and, and Anheuser-Busch InBev, is that the, uh, what they're called now? That's 80% of the beer market right now. Um, and they treat customers like captives. They give you really crappy stuff that they charge you too much money for. Their market share is going down like this, uh, and, and sales are down year and year, or, or at least flat. It's the other 20%. It's the long tail of the beer market where people do have a choice and are doing interesting experiments. It's craft beer. It's Anchor Steam, which we've been drinking uh, this uh, weekend, uh, thanks to Manny. Uh, that is on the increase. That grows 10%, 12%. It's where customers can create their own workarounds, create their own products. They are. They're fleeing. We don't really have that option. Um, the two main ways that I see that uh, sort of causes for people to flee the brands right now are precisely because Republicans have sold themselves forever as a party of limited government, and they just haven't been. Uh, they're starting to talk about it now for the first time since 1994, but the story that they tell themselves and they tell the country has not been true. Same with Democrats. They've been telling themselves and the country, we're the party of civil liberties, we're the party of, of anti-war or limited war. That's also not true. And people. Uh, who are everywhere else in their lives, speciating, hyphenating themselves wildly, they don't find themselves served by these two brands. And with that, uh, Nick, I believe we have a video to illustrate that concept. All you can say about the 2000s... Uh, yeah. The 2000s were the absolute worst decade, at least since the 1990s. Lockbox. Fuzzy math. Lockbox. Fuzzy math. Lockbox. Fuzzy math. Lockbox. Fuzzy math. The worst thing about Gore v. Bush was that one side had to win. Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. God damn it. Bush hadn't dodged that well since Vietnam. Barney, there's no easy way to say this. 
but we're out of money. I don't know what's more disturbing, that he's talking to a dog like David Berkowitz, or that he told Barney two years before he told the rest of us that we're out of money. Awesome. What newspapers and magazines did you regularly read? Um, all of them. The sad thing is she might be smarter than Joe Biden. When the stock market crashed, Franklin Roosevelt got on television. That's the most persistent fly I've ever seen. Reagan could do that with his eyes. Reporting for duty. No wonder we lost Vietnam. That didn't do anything wrong. I have nothing to hide. I like that guy's hair. I've been unfaithful to my life. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I'm truly sorry. Please let me apologize. I miss the 90s when our politicians had sex in actual rooms. Will you please stop dancing? This is the clip reel of the dam. He's always had a problem with exit strategies. We all remember Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. I've now been in 57 states. What? Why aren't we questioning the underlying premise of the need for a bailout with taxpayers' money? Anytime Dennis Kucinich is the voice of reason, you know you're really screwed. That the Nobel Peace Prize for 2009 is to be awarded to President Barack Obama. Worst decade ever. And the Academy Award goes to? Thanks. Okay, so uh, so what do we do uh, with the info that uh, we've compiled in Declaration of Independence? Uh, you know, and what, what do we do with the fact that the major parties have leaking market share, uh, that the government in many ways is out of control in a way that was really, uh, is not just stunning, but it's also, uh, you, nobody would have been predicting this 10 years ago or more, the, the way in which government is spending. Uh, you know, in, uh, uh, since Bill Clinton left office, fe total federal outlays adjusted for inflation have increased over 60%. And between Paul Ryan's budget plan and Obama's budget plan, the choices are, uh, are we going to increase spending over the next decade by 30% or 50%? Uh, in, in Bill Clinton's last year in office, the government, the federal government spent 18% of GDP. Ryan, over the next decade, would average 20.5% of GDP. Obama would be 23% of GDP. I mean, these are odd shifts, you know, where things are just ratcheting up and up. So what, what do we do? And uh, in the Declaration of Independence, what we offer are a couple of uh, ways of addressing these issues. And, and first and foremost, what we do is focus on what Matt was talking about, that in our personal lives, in our economic lives, in our cultural lives, in our uh, family lives and our sexual lives, we are hyphenating more and more, uh, at least in the states where it's legal. And, uh, uh, but you know, there is a huge amount of innovation and change and kind of customer appeal that is going on. I mean, you know, when you think about what you can get on TV, what you can get on the internet, what you can get sent to your home, uh, as long as you're not in Washington, D.C. and a fan of John Stalliano's films, you can get just about anything without anybody taking issue with it. When it comes to the public sector, that's not true, especially in three areas. Education, healthcare, and retirement, where the government still dominates. And to go back to the idea of democratization and decentralization of power and decision making, we don't have the amount of decision making or decentralization of power when it comes to K through 12 education, especially health care. Uh, we already, uh, you know, with the, uh, the government is spending 50% of all health care healthcare dollars, and if Obamacare goes through as planned, that, that will mostly be gone or everything will be subject to regulation. Uh, or dictate from the, uh, from the federal government and the state governments. And retirement, where uh, because of the way that Medicare, because of the way that Social Security is set up, we are basically locked into really bad uh, retirement plans that suck up a lot of the money that younger and poorer people would have to start paying for their retirement or saving for their retirement. And instead, you get locked into a system of Social Security returns now for uh, current retirees a, a little bit less than 2% a year on the amount of money if it had it been invested in other types of uh, investments. <laughs> for people who are 20 years away from retiring and whatnot, the res uh, it's almost certain that the 
net uh, the net returns on your uh, investment on the payroll taxes that get thrown into what's called a retirement plan, but there is no lockbox as Al Gore uh, fondly uh, was running on, which would have been a nice thing, but it'll be a, a negative return. So what we do is we focus on those three areas where the government still dominates, and then we talk about how traditional approaches to solving these problems are making, uh, have brought us to ruin to uh, we are so out of money moment, which is a recurring theme both at Reason Magazine, at Reason.com, in our videos, and certainly in the book, where when you look at things, uh, you know, at the, at the federal level, we've got right now a $14, billion or $14 trillion debt, which is essentially uh, the equivalent of the economy. Uh, at the uh, state level, we have shortfalls, basically about 48 states out of 50 have definite shortfalls over the next two year budgeting period. And they, it's not gonna come back any uh, time soon. I live, I pay taxes in Ohio and uh, John Kasich was elected as a real government cutter and he's you know a fiscal hawk and we know this because of his time in Congress and then he warned people I'm going to release a budget this was uh, about a month ago I'm going to release a budget and you know get ready for some real changes uh, the real change or the top line result is that he increases spending over two years by 11 percent <laughs> and that's austerity right you know uh, so and then um, you know at the, at the local level as well uh, Paul finds uh, and Alex Manning's excellent video about Sandy Springs, Georgia, which you saw before, that has a stat in it about the hundreds <coughs> of billions of dollars that cities, localities all over the country have as an aggregate debt coming up. Uh, so, you know, we are out of money, and what's good about that is that it gives us the opportunity to start talking about what you stop doing as a government or how you reform things, because there really is no option uh, anymore. I mean, or one would hope. It, and, when you look at politicians, uh, and this includes people like Rand Paul and Ron Paul and Mike Lee, the senator from Utah, a variety of other people who are putting out serious plans. The Republican Study Committee, which uh, pretty much rubber stamped every increase uh, that uh, George Bush wanted to uh, put into the federal budget, uh, have actually come up with a, uh, with a plan that would restrain spending, would bring it back down to uh, kind of 2000 era uh, levels, which is good. So we provide uh, proven policy alternatives. Uh, in each of these things, we talk about how uh, federal government can be restrained through uh, essentially um, uh, mild cuts in expected growth over the next decade. And by the end of the uh, 2020, we could have a balanced budget with some money left over. And that's, that's not even be really breaking a sweat. That's actually pretty easy to do. We take a lot of ideas from people like Lisa Snell and Claire Mullen about school choice and about devolving decision making and, uh, and uh, responsibility to the local level, to the parental level, to the school level. And uh, when it comes to retirement, we come up with a bunch of different ways in, in health care, which will be uh, familiar to people who read Reason and follow it. But always the proven solutions are about democratization and decentralization, of giving individuals more power to make more decisions about what matters most to them, and because they best know what they want, and they know uh, best how to deal with it. And uh, with that, we're going to uh, go to uh, one more video, assuming uh, there we are. Thanks for tuning in to Budget Chef on Reason TV. I'm Nick Gillespie. Today we're going to prepare a balanced budget by the year 2020. And for a special treat, we're going to do this without raising taxes. Now at first this seems like a really complicated dish, but in fact it's so incredibly simple that virtually any elected official should be able to pull it off. All you have to do is spend no more than you're taking in. Now this big piece of pork here represents the combined budgets for the next 10 years. In order to balance the budget in 2020, what we need to do is to find a total of $1.3 trillion in cuts, or about $130 billion a year in each of the next 10 years. That sounds like a lot until you realize you only need to trim 3.6% of each year's budget. So here's the budget for 2011. To get started on the balanced budget, all we need to do is to cut this little piece of fat right here. Now let's work on the next nine budgets. You know, with this dish, you'll wow your trading partners and foreign and domestic investors. 
And by making small systematic cuts in the fatty parts of the budget over the next decade, we'll compound all our savings. And here's 2020's budget, which is projected to come in at about $5 trillion. But because we trimmed all this fat, this is looking pretty edible. It wasn't so hard, was it? If you want the full recipe for how to balance the budget without raising taxes, you'll find it online at Reason.com. Now, let's roast this baby. Bon Appetit. Um, we're trying to be part of the serious policy debate in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I am very happy uh, in the, of the unplanned accident that this will be the second book that I'm involved with, and both are at heart uh, attacks on David Brooks. Um, <laughs> uh, my first book was about uh, John McCain and specifically his embodiment of the project that David Brooks and Bill Kristol started in 1997 of national greatness conservatism, or a kind of progressive conservatism, as he's later uh, described it, which is a more muscular, very uh, strongly interventionist, both economically and militarily abroad, and, uh, and just physically re reckless on every level as a part uh, of a way to sort of cleanse our national consciousness, and everyone's going to have national service and, and everything else with it. Um, David Brooks wrote that in 1997. One of the first um, great critiques of it came from Virginia Postrel, then editor of Reason Magazine, and a dear friend of all of us here, uh, uh, attacked it rightly as a recipe for big government and vague and uh, ominous sounding plans. Um, Brooks lost in 2000. Their can candidate was John McCain. And they lost to George W. Bush, who I know we don't remember it now, but he ran on a more humble foreign policy and more decentralized this is and that. After September 11th, he took a much more David Brooksian line. And from that moment on, the columnist focused on trying to build a permanent governing majority. And I sometimes just try to think, what would my brain have to work like? How would I draw the six and move my foot if I woke up in the morning? You know, how can we come up with a permanent governing majority of my tribe. Just as there's, some, there's something about that to me that just sounds uh, kind of frighteningly authoritarian. Right before the 2004 uh, Republican National Convention, which itself was a pretty frighteningly authoritarian experience for some of us who went there, um, David Brooks came up with a very long cover story for New York Times Magazine that I encourage all of you to reread about once a year just to re-frighten yourself about uh, where we can go again. And where he talked about, we're going to build a permanent governing majority of Republicanism once we ditch libertarianism once and for all, which he always uh, mentions by name, uh, and uh, if we embrace this progressive conservatism, the era of of limited government is over, he declared, if only we spend a lot more money on education, on solving problems, and restoring our sense of national honor. As in a lot of things with uh, David Brooks, all of his predictions were wrong, and yet everybody followed his advice. Um, uh, the Republicans under George W. Bush went on a, uh, a memorable spending bid, which we all know. And right about the time that Brooks wrote this, we had the beginning of something basically opposite of what he was saying. Instead of a permanent governing majority of big spending Republicans, we have now entered into an era, thanks to both technology and what we've all learned from the internet and, and all the advances in our lives, where it's more about the permanent non-governing minority. Um, a series of disaffected people who are tired of the political status quo, who use the tools from the private sector to disrupt and, and uh, make uncomfortable the sclerotic status quo. Slide. Um, call these online swarms. Uh, you can date it back to 2000 if you want. I think 2004 is really the first great iteration of this. Democrats historically have had a pretty strong or at least vocal anti-war wing, uh, sp specifically when a Republican is the president, obviously. Um, but that wing had gone disrespected for a long time. Bill Clinton, especially in the second term, turned out to be a big interventionist. Democrats kept 
uh, uh, nominating or supporting people who differentiated themselves as tough Democrats by being more pro-intervention. But the 2004 presidential campaign, this led, the, the ignoring this tradition led to a big backlash in the swarm which coalesced around the character of Howard Dean. It's no accident that when you saw this backlash, this therefore became the most internet savvy wing of modern American politics. Uh, because the internet is what the disaffected use to gather themselves. Um, so, they, which is all ironic, because Howard Dean was in favor of four of the previous five uh, interventions, but he just didn't like Iraq. Um, so, 2003, 2004, that online swarm was the Howard Dean Democrats. Notably, the Democrats hired him then to be the chair of the National uh, uh, Committee, which we'll talk about in a second. 2006, I think you could say the online swarm was more about Bush derangement syndrome. It was the high water, well, which I still suffer from, by the way. Um, it was the uh, high water mark of, of the liberal net roots. Uh, they were ascendant. They memorably uh, took on Joe Lieberman with uh, an anti-war candidate, Ned Lamont, and then ended up losing uh, in the general election to Joe Lieberman again. Um, but that's where that uh, uh, was centered. 2008, I think we had two online swarms. There was still the anti-war contingent net roots that coalesced around Barack Obama, who at one point was not everyone's favorite candidate, but he was the most sort of strong and articulate anti-Iraq war. And then there was the Ron Paul revolution, which obviously I find much more interesting on some level. Um, but again, which was speaking to both the anti-interventionist tradition on the, on the right wing and, and among young people, but specifically about the Republican you know, uh, wing of the Republican Party. The idea that we should be about limiting government and promoting free enterprise, which had been completely lost. Uh, all of these things become the most internet savvy. Ron Paul ran the most internet savvy campaign of anyone in 2008, which is pretty bizarre for a 70 year old who probably still hasn't used the internet uh, yet in his life. Uh, 2010, if you look at the disrespected American tradition uh, that was being disrespected by both parties, people who hated the bailouts. We've had a two-party bailout system since September of 2008, and the Tea Party has risen up specifically against that. There is a American tradition of like, you don't, you, you, you let people fail. Uh, and the Tea Party has risen up using the internet again, more sophisticated than anybody else, and coalesced. What does this mean going forward? I think that's where we're in the most interesting territory. <coughs> the Tea Party, unlike the, uh, Howard Dean movements and the, uh, the anti-war movement never got domesticated or hasn't yet. Howard Dean subsumed himself in, in the uh, Democratic Party and now there is no anti-war movement anymore. That is essentially finished. The Tea Party has, like the Democrats did with uh, Joe Lieberman, they have entered some races, lost some races, and shown that they're just crazy enough to not be Republicans. Uh, and in, in uh, our argument, therefore have maintained their potency. It is the independence, it's their outsiderness that have allowed them and to remain powerful. And I think they, they will continue being powerful throughout 2012. However, going forward, any tradition in America that is disrespected by both parties uh, that, and that has a venerable tradition is susceptible to the same thing. I would uh, uh, look for, and I'm not just saying this because Rob Campy is in the room, but in 2012, you'll see something similar happen coalescing around the drug war. Um, uh, it, specifically, the legalization of the Prop 19 uh, in California in 2010, which distanced, it went further than even marijuana activists had wanted them to go, was a sign that finally people who trend towards Democrats because they like them on issues of drug war realize that that has been hollow and there's nothing behind it forever. And so we're going to see full legalization, I think, in a handful of states in 2012. Some of the areas where we're going to see these online swarms are not going to be friendly to libertarians at all. But that is the future of American politics because it is so easy to take what we have learned from the private sector and inflict it on the public sector. Declaration of Independence, name of the book. We have the TS, they have the CE. It's a great document to reread and not just because of the tales of you know, Indian savagery and, uh, and other uh, elements of it that we uh, tend to forget. Um, Great source code. Uh, we talk a lot about the concept of source codes, both in this document and in other documents in uh, American literature. They don't talk about life and liberty and the pursuit of politics. <laughs> it's not the pursuit of meet the press or face the nation. It's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
I think embedded in that is an idea that is wonderful and radical, and it turned out to be correct, that the stuff worth living, the stuff worth having and doing, was the stuff that you could do away from the scene of politics. It was an acknowledgment that if the government gets out of your way, you are going to do interesting things. You might fail. You might have trouble. But you're going to be able to pursue your dream. I think within that shows us where we go from here. We take what we've learned pursuing that happiness and not pursuing meet the press and politics. And we use it because we're in another moment that's also embedded in the source code, which is when in the course of human events. Unfortunately, we are in the course of human events. We don't have the option to sit this one out as much as we might have had in the past. We're running out of money. They're inflicting it on us, on our grandchildren. And so going forward, we're going to have to take what we've learned through the pursuit of happiness and inflict it back on politics so we can begin to get our country and our lives back in order. And with that, Nick, I think you're going to show an example of how we pursue happiness in modern America. <laughs> That's as good as I notice any to end on. <laughs> <laughs>